So really big thank you uh, to everyone. Uh, we'll get kicked off here so that you can have the most time to hear from our, our wonderful speakers. And thanks everyone for your patience. Um, great tech support from our team and, and we really appreciate uh, everyone rolling with the punches this morning. So uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Una Lounder. Um, I'm the Social Innovation and Impact Manager here at Venture for Canada. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to this session on uh, increasing psychological safety in the workplace by embracing failure. Um, we have an incredible panel of speakers here uh, to share their experience and expertise on psychological safety and protecting employee mental health by creating a collaborative environment where failure provides valuable opportunities for learning. So I'm really, really honored to invite or, or to introduce our panelists. We've got Priyanka, Andrea, and Mayan. They bring together uh, collective experience in activism, innovation and entrepreneurship, accessibility, leadership, people operations, coaching, uh, creative in creating inclusive workspaces, and, and so much more. Um, I've always felt like no one can tell your own story better than you. So we'll invite all of the panelists to actually introduce themselves and their organizations and to uh, you know, share their work and, and kick us off by sharing their thoughts on um, one opening question, which will, uh, is what is psychological safety in the workplace? What does that mean in 2022? And um, maybe we'll hand it over to Priyanka to kick us off. So Priyanka, can you uh, just share a little bit about yourself, your work, and um, what does psychological safety mean in the workplace in 2022? Thank you, Una. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Priyanka Mandirata. I'm the founder and CEO of Unmute. Unmute is a leadership development company whose main purpose is creating workforce for the future. And given the question, I think it's a very heavy question that we can spend all day along. However, we have limited time. Um, in the essence of the time we have, I would like to share my screen and I hope it works. So just give me one moment so I can kick that, um, the session. Um, I'm not able to share my screen for some reason. Give me one sec. Okay. I hope the screen is visible. Give me one second. All right. So is it visible, Luna? We can see it. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. So as I said, I'm the founder and CEO of Unmute. Unmute in 2022 is no longer only a Zoom button, but it means who you are, what do you represent, your voice, your ethics, and your values. And the goal is creating the workforce of the future. And when you talk about psychological safety, I want you to clearly understand this and I'm assuming whether you are an individual contributor or a leader in your career or life, it happens with all of us. When one of our bosses or peers are saying something for an idea, we want to say, no, ma no, no, no. And all we say, say I, say yes. This is the opposite of psychological safety. And this is how most of us are working, even in 2022. And that has to go. Psychological safety, um, as a word, it was coined by Amy Edmondson, which is who is a very famous professor at Howard Reader in 1999. However, the meaning for psychological safety is changing every day based on which organization you work for, whether you work for yourself or as a, in a simpler form, psychological safety means every employee is, is can work without fear of judgment, have a voice in, in the conversation and innovations without fear of repercussions and failure. And why do I say that? Um, just a quick introduction to, to attach what I'm saying. I've been recently awarded as a top 10 women entrepreneur in Canada, top 10 most influential women in technology 2020, featured in Valiant CEO Magazine, 15 years in talent management and founder and CEO of Unmute. What's the first thing you, what's how you define me in one word? If I can get some answers on the board very quickly, maybe two or three. And if somebody wants to unmute themselves, um, I'm happy to hear that. Thank you so much for that. I have failed. I failed with relationships. I failed with jobs. I failed as a daughter. I failed as a wife. I failed consistently, but I'm not a failure. What I'm trying to put here, organizations today have to build a culture around failure so people are not afraid to speak up even beyond the screens because the way we work today is hybrid. 
We allow our failures to define who we are. We allow others to define us through our failures. Why? I'm sorry. We have been told that failure is not an option since we are children and we are socially conditioned to behave in that way. And as leaders, if we have any leaders on the conversation today, it starts with you. You really need to make sure you're bringing your failures to the table so everybody around you feels safe to bring them their own. It's just a quick model here that's usually happen when we detect failure. Our, our reaction is like fight or find somebody to blame. What I'm asking you to analyze it, apply the learning because this is where innovation starts. Apply the feedback, detect failure, and it's a constant loop because if you're not failing, you're not succeeding. And I am the example here. I'm sitting here based on my failures. Something to take away, failure is an event, not who you are. It's not who you are. Failure is what happens to you, not what you are. And that's very important here. My goal is wherever you are in, in, in your life, career, um, individual contributor, a leader, um, a professional, a freelancer, start a applying these mindset with a growth mindset. Is it take five minutes to reflect every day. Respond to failure by saying how fascinating and show bad news is shared as openly as good news. Reward those who take smart risk. Host the fail forward festivals, to, especially from leaders who are failing. Bring those failures to your conversations, to your daily meetings. That's how we change culture. And include, very important, it's kind of be a mind blogging thing for February 22 is include what if I screw up section in your handbook for your new employees, or even if your job, job description, because it's time to unmute. Thank you, Priyanka. That was incredible. So many takeaways. I'm writing notes myself over here. Um, I just really a uh, strong way to kick us off. And, and uh, for those who don't know, Priyanka is joining us from India. So we're very uh, pleased to have her here with this massive time change. I'm so excited to uh, to hear from the other panelists as well. So uh, in order of my screen, <laughs> the way you're showing up, uh, let's kick it over to Andrea. So, um, you know, just uh, introducing yourself, your work, your organization, and what does psychological safety mean in the workplace in 2022? Thanks, Una, and good morning or good evening, everyone. Priyanka, that's a tough act to follow. Um, but let me share a little bit about me, my background, and what I hope to add to this conversation. So I live in San Francisco. I've worked for many San Francisco Bay Area companies, um, many brands you know, Levi Strauss, Lucasfilm, Airbnb, and Autodesk. And What's true in all of them is um, they had a very strong mission and culture, one in which I was really proud to be a part of. So I've been in HR, talent management most of my career. I recently co-founded a consulting firm and collective with three other people, one of whom's a speaker today. Um, so I hope you'll join Jasmine Kernelegwen's um, speaking topic uh, in a few hours. Uh, but Vibrancy is really about creating an organization where all people can live their best potential. Teams can create performance together and we reduce bureaucracy because really in 2022, we're talking about psychological safety, which is super important, but we also have structures and process that are outdated and that are really cutting off the oxygen for everyone. Uh, before we even begin to think about bias and belonging and other aspects of work that are hard enough. So one thing Vibrancy is trying to do is really ground our clients in the idea of belonging and how fundamental that is for anyone to feel like they can take risks. Mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure people are aligned in their purpose, both their personal purpose, their work purpose, and feel a sense of alignment with the company's purpose. Then we work on two different aspects of learning. One is individual leadership skills for everyone. So how do I navigate myself? And then also how does the organization introduce new practices that sort of unleash the group's thinking, reduces the sense of north, south hierarchical power, uh, really brings all voices together, allows teams to create commitment, allows teams 
to create um, accountability and really freedom for all to do their best work. So that's a little bit about vibrancy. Um, so what I'd love to offer is a story and some data about the idea of belonging. So belonging is a fundamental human need without which we really would suffer from a physical standpoint and we would even die um, if we did not sense belonging for a long period of time. We've evolved socially for it to be very important as part of our sense of security. It was how we secured food in the past. So now 2022, here we all are in our very our safe homes looking at screens. And yet belonging is still very much part of what we are looking for each and every day um, with individuals, with teams within an organization. So Greg Walton is someone I've studied a lot of his work around. He is at Stanford and is the foremost leader on belonging. And when I was at Airbnb, the mission at the company was to create a world where anyone could belong anywhere. And many people are familiar with using Airbnb and, you know, as a stranger, you're walking into someone else's home. Um, and really what we found is the best hosts created a sense of safety, connection and belonging. When I was at Airbnb, we turned that same research inside and said, how can more people belong here? And what we really learned is there's sort of three layers, not unlike Martin Seligman's um, layers of happiness. Um, this is about layers of belonging, me and you. So do I feel a sense of belonging with you? Do I feel safe? Do I feel heard? Um, so we see that a lot with managers. So that's the individual sense of belonging. Do I belong in this team? Am I feeling like this team is valuing my contributions? My manager might, uh, but when they're not in the room, am I feeling like I'm also being able to take risks without retribution, concern, reputational risk? And then lastly, do I feel like I belong in this organization? So sometimes those signs and signals are through the actions of leaders. Uh, it could be who's on the leadership team, do people look like me? It could be signs and symbols inside the physical work environment. So really these three layers of belonging are really critical to understand, to understand the baseline for psychological safety. Um, so for me, I think the story I wanna share is like Priyanka, I, I've been able to lead in, in some great companies and have the privilege of leading people inside those companies. Um, but I too have a sense of, do I belong or not every day? Um, so I often will bring people along around their own story. Where do I feel like I belong? And sometimes it's important when we're talking about these concepts to really break it down into a memory you've had in your life. And so I'd ask everyone to think for a moment, when is the time you felt like you really belonged? Where you didn't think about what you were saying, you weren't second guessing it, you felt like you were in the zone. It could be through writing. It could be through contribution in a room. It doesn't have to be an extroverted sense of belonging. But feel free to share that moment, that kernel of when I felt like I belong. And for me, I am baby of six kids. And all the family dynamics aside, I often go back to the moment of like reuniting with my family and we live all, all over North America. And that sense of like true belonging is what fuels me. I feel like I can be just a sister and a friend without being judged. Um, but for me, a, a time that I, I didn't feel I belonged, I worked in a company for years and came of age professionally in a company that was run almost entirely by women. The first time I went into a company, believe it or not, where um, it was male dominated and male led, I was in my thirties. The first leadership team meeting I went to, I was shushed. I was asked to just hold for a second. I was so taken aback. I did not understand what was going on. Um, and as you can imagine, like that reptile brain took over. How well do you think I 
could contribute from that point on. How confident was I in taking a risk in that room where people like me need to step out and share truth with power? So it's those types of stories that we need to remember when we are trying to create belonging for our people. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was, I mean, just already hearing some common themes around leadership and being open and belonging. And I just, it's so strong. Um, I want to make sure we get uh, time to welcome Mayan to the stage and to introduce, um, you know, their work and uh, and then also have time for audience questions. So uh, before Mayan starts, would just um, encourage everyone as you're hearing these, you know, insights and thoughts to um, to pop your questions into the Q&A so that we can, uh, we can keep track of those moving forward but uh, Mayim, please uh, take it away. All right. Well, hello, everyone. It's really nice to be here. Uh, and, and I'm really excited about this conversation because I think we each bring such different perspectives. And that's really another way in which you can kind of signal to people a sense of psychological safety that those are welcome. That, you know, even if you have a different opinion, it's welcome, a different perspective. So a bit about me to start. Uh, my name is Mayan Ziv. I'm the founder CEO of a company based in Toronto uh, called Access Now. And Access Now really began with my own experience as someone who actually often felt like an outsider. Uh, it's not always obvious when I'm on a, a virtual call, but I use a wheelchair and I have since I was a very little girl. And I've constantly you know, navigated through spaces and environments where I could literally see that the built environment was not a space that was designed for me. It wasn't designed to be inclusive to people with disabilities. And that's really, you know, the, the kind of way that I've grown up is from that perspective of knowing that unintentionally or sometimes accidentally, uh, the world has not actually been uh, inclusively designed. And so, you know, I think the reason that I even started my company, which is focused on connecting people to information about the accessibility of spaces and experiences around the world is really, you know, ties back to my personal deep need to find a sense of belonging, to find a sense of spaces that were welcome and, and open and inviting uh, to people with disabilities like myself. And along the way, you know, what I've had the pleasure of doing is, is learning about all of the different needs and perspectives that people with various disabilities or people who are non-disabled have in terms of how people show up in a space virtually or physically and what is required in order for them to even be there, to do their work, to feel heard or to even speak. And so I spend a lot of my time thinking about this concept of accessibility. Uh, and, and that's really what I'm bringing to the conversation today is the role of accessibility in helping to increase psychological safety. So often when we think about accessibility, we think about accessibility from the perspective of like, this like awkward or add on thing that people need. Uh, and it's usually associated with a group of specific people. Like an antiquated model of thinking of accessibility would be, you know, like the grab bar that you see in the washroom. It's bolted on, it's kind of uncomfortable and ugly and looks like it was added after the fact because it always has been. It can be functional, but it doesn't feel like it really blends in. It doesn't feel like it's part of an experience that was intentionally designed to be there. And really, you know, the future of accessibility is understanding that, first of all, accessibility means different things to different people. And although, yes, it should be uh, inspired and co-created with people with disabilities, accessibility benefits every single person and can manifest in many different ways. So the fact that we're all able to join today from different parts of the world and have this conversation is a form of accessibility. The fact that you might you know, be reading captions when you're watching a video or tuning into a live talk is a form of accessibility. And it never 
even these two tiny examples, I could list a whole lot more, but even these two little examples, you know, they never single you out. They never ask you to be a certain type of person in order to use the tool or the service. They don't ask you to self-identify and say, I need this thing. Oh, if you need this thing, go wait in that line. The, the beauty of accessibility, which directly builds into inclusive design, is that all of a sudden you don't feel a sense of othering. And that's so critical to feeling that sense of belonging that Andrea talked about and really helps to build upon, you know, how do I feel safe and secure and, and supported to, to achieve? So happy to kind of open up that discussion and contribute more. But I think when we talk about psychological safety in the workplace or anywhere for that matter, it's so important to think about, you know, how can we intentionally design our spaces functionally, uh, physically and invisibly to be the most accessible and inclusive spaces we can, we can come up with. And the only way to do that is to include people who are not like you in part of the co-creation of those spaces. Yeah. So that's how I'll kick off my, my part. I wanted to keep it short so we can get to some dialogue, but really happy to be here. Thanks so much, Maya. And that's, uh, that was fantastic. And I, I really like, you know, what you said about being, you know, inspired by and co-created with. And I think that's actually really a good segue into like, maybe I'll just kick off one question to everybody. And then we were getting some great questions in the chat. So, so then we'll hand it over to the audience. But I think, and you started kind of touching on this in, in those examples. And I think, you know, for the folks who are here today, like practical, tangible takeaways, how can they action, um, you know, in their own organizations? So, you know, what can, companies do to proactively address barriers and create psychological safety in the workplace? And, and you touched on a few, but would love to just pass it over to, to all of the panelists. Sort of what are you seeing? What are some of your tips? And, and where have you seen examples of this really working well? Well, I can go first. Um, psychological safety, um, it's a very heavy word. And when you start talking about psychological safety and you sit on the table and ask for budgets to roll those conversations in the workplace, usually people don't get, leaders don't get a budget for have conversations like that. Why? Because it exposes them. It exposes them to a fear of failure that they have been failing, but they don't bring these conversations, as I said, because socially failure is not something as a part of our conversations daily. Um, so, so to answer your question, psychological safety starts with individuals because organization are a bunch of people. It has to start with you. Um, and as Mayan said, um, and Andrea said, belonging, you know, no one can make you feel belong unless you are being authentic about who you are. If you don't hold conversations, if you don't unmute yourself and say, hey, this doesn't work for me. I can't take more work. You know, I'm fully committed. I have to go and pick my child. You know what? Today I need a mental health day. You know, these are some of the small examples that you can start as individual. So the people around you can start benchmarking these conversations and make it normal. I mean, normal is such a cliche word, but, you know, we really have to normalize that because we are not doing that. So psychological safety will take years if it's not a part of your life or career as an organization or leader. However, change starts with us. And we belong to those because if we don't do it now, after being two years in the pandemic, it's never gonna happen. And we as individuals are not speaking up because as I said, the first me where said, we are keep saying yes to the thing that doesn't work for us. And that in the end and say, hey, it's not working for me. You know, so like onus is on us. So you really have to say, what can I do differently so today or tomorrow I can feel safe and bring this innovation idea or my failures to the table without fear of being judged. I hope that connects the dots here. Yeah, I would just invite the, the panelists to, to jump in and, and just uh, dive into the question. Mayan, Andrea, who wants to go next? I'm happy to... 
add to, I, I completely agree with, you know, starting with that inner circle, which is you and knowing your story, knowing what, um, fills you up when you feel like touching base with when you feel like you belong mm -hmm. and when you don't, and it takes time, but as you build rapport with your team, whether it's virtually or with a manager or many managers, um, it's really starting to share that story so that people can start to understand where you're coming from and when you feel like you belong and when you don't. So two quick examples. Um, when you onboard new employees into a fast growing startup, one thing we did at Airbnb when we were in that really fast stage to increase belonging was two things. We added a moment in which um, we asked somebody who's coming into the organization to share some knowledge about anything, honestly, but usually related to work to the team so that they could be seen as an expert. Because often we like pump someone up in the interview process and then we walk in and it's like, now you need to become like us is sort of the symbol or signs that people get intentionally or not. And suddenly imposter syndrome sort of ekes in. So really helping people do something very small in front of the group or with the group to produce work and share their expertise. Another thing was we had a very small sticky note exercise where we asked people in the onboarding um, to think about what in their life they want to protect as they start this new job. It could be, I want to have dinner with my family in the evenings. I want to be able to, you know, find time in the day to do meditation. And they would share that in their onboarding with their team. And then the team protects that commitment that person has for themselves. So it's again, like helping us sort of shed some of those layers of like, I need to come in looking great, sort of like that slide Priyanka shared. It's like so easy to show our resume, a little harder to share sort of the complications of one's life. So just little things like that can really increase a person's sense of belonging as they're onboarding. And maybe I'll just chime in and add, um, you know, so I mentioned a little bit about kind of the importance of uh, tools or, or platforms or, you know, products that can be accessible. Um, but I think it's equally as important to signal, you know, throughout the entire experience, even when, you know, from the onboarding stage or, or the hiring stage, what are the types of things that are important to you as an organization that you can signal to others to be part of that kind of protection process? And so something that we do, uh, and we're a small team, we're 15 people, um, but we're not like the size of Airbnb. Uh, but what I can say is something that we've done that we've really um, enjoyed, and, and this kind of actually comes from my theater days, uh, is silliness. So mm -hmm. it's really, really important for me as a leader and within my company, and I do this outside of my company, I do it with anyone that I work with, is to include a sense of silliness. And the reason we do that, so we might ask silly questions, like if you, you know, if you were a type of rice, what type of rice would you be? And then people <laughs> have to decide, you know, oh, I'd be orzo or I'd be, you know, whatever, brown rice. And people talk about, and then you have to have a whole story about why. And it's totally silly. But first of all, it lets people just feel like it's okay to say silly things, which is so important to increasing that, that sense of I can fail, I can do things that are not perfect, I can be silly, I can make jokes um, that allow people to just loosen up a bit. And I think when we get so uh, kind of tense about perfection and performance and productivity, we, we often lose sight of that kind of like more youthful childlike silliness that actually allows people to take a breath and, and come forward with new ideas. And it's important to also recognize that silliness can show up in different people's mannerisms and the way that they speak. And so, again, if you then validate with that, with, you know, every single perspective is valid and not, oh, that's a better silly answer than somebody else's. There's no better silly answer. Everybody's answer is important. So 
uh, it's just a random thing that we do. Um, and I really enjoy it. And I do find that it produces just like a really enjoyable way to open up a conversation where, okay, we're not talking about psychological safety. We're just, being, you know, yeah. Humor is so important mm -hmm. every day. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Even just hearing you ask the question, I started smiling, <laughs> right? Like it just, it has that effect. I, I love that. Thank you all for your responses. This is great. Um, I want to make sure we get a few questions from the, the audience here. So wondering, we've got a question here. So um, what can mid-level leaders do when executive leadership is not receptive to feedback and thus has already fostered an environment that is not psychologically safe? So, you know, what are, what, can um, workers and employees do at that level? Well, I can go um, there since I work with a lot of uh, mid-level executives. Um, so I'm just going to repeat the question just to make sure it's always good. So the question is, what can mid-level leaders do when executive leadership is not receptive to feedback and this has already fostered an environment that is not psychologically safe? Um, since I'm the founder and CEO of Unmute, so I'm going to unmute myself and literally say it's a big culture problem. And it's not a one day thing that can be fixed through like anonymous survey or anything fancy. It's a big culture issue. If leaders are not accepting candid feedback, it simply means they that company or that team or that department is not psychologically safe. And all they do is go get the task done, do or die, you know, take it or leave it. And that's the culture that needs to change. And it starts from the top. So somebody has to be a whistleblower. Somebody has to take this, like, you know what, enough. It's, it's time to change. This is not working for me. And again, I'm not saying go and, you know, rebel yourself. No, that's what I'm not saying. But somebody has to start the conversation, take your leader into perspective and say, hey, I don't feel good anymore. You know, it's affecting my mental health. It's affecting how I work, my productivity and performance. Can you help me have those candid conversations and start? And it's not going to happen in one day. It's going to take years, but somebody has to take the bull by the horn and say, hey, let's fix this. Because if it's not, if it's not, then it, if leaders are not speaking and following their actions, it's, it's, a, it's I'm sorry, it's a shit show. I'm, and it's a culture problem. Thank you. Andrea, Mayan, please feel free to jump in. Uh, I would agree, you know, psychologically safe, high belonging environments require leaders to lead with uh, some yes. vulnerability and willingness to accept feedback. I think, you know, given we're in a conference related to startups. I, w I think that it's important to set that expectation early and mm -hmm. to create very simple mechanisms for feedback around belonging and psychological safety. There's tons of simple instruments you can use that are not fancy. Um, if I were a leader of a startup, which I am, um, with a, a large group of people forming and following behind the mission, um, which we are not at yet, uh, but I would want to establish early and often the practice of measuring how much do you feel like you belong day to day inside teams. You know, these very quick hit um, measurements are, are really hard to deny when someone's own sense of belonging feels at risk. Um, how often do you feel like you can take risks in environments? A great question. Um, what environments do you feel like you can? Uh, take risks easily, which ones can't you inside an organization. So just really starting to get the data flowing in an aggregate way, because it is a, an act of courage to try to um, un, sort of unmask a leader who is not listening. And just to add, thank you, Andrea. That's, that's really great insights here. That's a lot of learning for me as well. I'm just dropping some of the tips that can be incorporated um, on a small basis, not like overnight change, but change is change and it, it can be small steps and hope the audience here will be benefited. So thank you. Mayan, do you have anything to add? I don't know. I think you guys really covered it well. I'm not sure I would add anything extra to that. I 
think, yeah. Um, I, yeah, and that's a, I appreciate both. I think those are fam fantastic answers. And, and uh, to your point, Priyanka, um, we can we can circulate any resources that um, the presenters want to share afterwards and make sure that those make them out. So um, we'll make sure that those are available. And uh, we are getting close to the end of our time. I can't believe it. I feel like 45 minutes is not enough to uh, really dive into all of the things that you have to talk about. And, and so I guess maybe last question to everyone is um, if, if there's one takeaway that you would have people leave with, you know, today, either as a leader themselves or as a worker in a, a startup or someone who's interested, um, what's, what's your one main takeaway for our audience? I can do it. I believe um, <laughs> it's time to unmute, like really unmute, because if you're not speaking up, and if you have a fear of judgment, if you look, keep looking for validation from outside, nothing is going to change how you work, where you work, because leader is not a title in 2022. It's a mindset. And that starts with you, whether you're an individual contributor or looking to accelerate your, you know, the, the next level job, you have to start modeling conversations around failure and normalize it. So unmute. It's not working for me. Unmute. Say it say it and see because if you're not having these courageous conversations we can have this conversation in an ear for an hour and nothing's gonna change so it's it, it's really time to unmute so speak up thank you I, i'll just maybe jump in and say i think you know as a tip that i would leave uh kind of as a piece of advice for for leaders or people who don't see themselves as leaders yet but would like to be uh, I think, you know, there's a, a really, what I've discovered over the course of just building my company and, you know, getting to this place where I'm speaking on stages and recognized as top this or, you know, ex ambassador that, I, I find that one of the most important things to do is to give space for people to grow into their own and to do it not because they were, like molded from the outside, but to, to find those like strains of confidence and, and allow space for those to be nurtured. So whether it's for you or for someone else, like each one of us has this like beautiful talent to offer. And it's not always, first of all, even obvious what that could be, but when you can trial and error and fail and just navigate building and working and, and and working with others, you'll develop into that space organically. And I think providing the space for people to do that is hard because you see someone do something, you're like, oh, I'll just show them how to do it. I'll just tell them how it needs to be done. But then it, it doesn't give that person the, the chance to grow through it and say, oh, I figured it out. It's mine. I did that. And that can really help create that sense of belonging and leadership that I think people really look for. So providing the space to allow people to find their own voice and, and, and be supportive when they do, I think is a really important thing to offer, especially to people who feel othered, to people who haven't felt like their voices matter or heard or the way that they think is, is important or, or good. So that's what I would offer. And I would just add a simple addition to Mayan's, I think, really sort of beautiful invitation to create space, practical idea for leaders. And that's every one of us when we're in a room with another, um, in particular, those who are in a power, powerful position of some sort, is to really resist the idea of being the smartest person in the room. Your job is to ask questions and really to hold space for that figuring out, because that is where the learning lives. Um, so really practically, like don't talk first, if you're the leader, create a space and time where you're only asking questions, invite the person that you're in discussion with or a team to offer suggestions, solutions or improvements to whatever topic is at hand. Um, and then just be clear about when and how decisions are made. So all that good work doesn't get 
sort of pummeled when uh, a leader takes back power and, and makes a decision where it doesn't feel like their ideas are accounted for. So really being thoughtful about questioning period and safe to fail, safe to ask anything is really important towards decision making and all of um, the work we do every day. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. I, I think really strong messages around having courageous, you know, conversations around helping people build their own confidence about holding that space, asking questions and clear communication. So that was I, uh, just a fantastic way to end our session today. Um, this has been incredible. And I just, uh, we will make sure to circulate um, resources to the audience and would really just like to take a moment to thank the speakers, um, Andrea, Priyanka, and Mayan. This has been fantastic. Your uh, your experiences and insights and stories are, are wonderful. And uh, we really thank you for your, your time and your energy today. And um, I would definitely encourage everyone to uh, sort of look for these three out on the internet if you want to learn more. I'm sure there are many, many links we can send out. And, and please um, continue following along with their work because I'm, I know I will be. It's really, um, really exciting and very important. So uh, thank you, all three of you. Um, would also like to very much thank our audience for tuning in today. This was um, exciting. It's great to see so many people so active in the chat and would encourage everyone to check out networking opportunities today. I think there is one happening right now before the next uh, sessions begin. So um, we'll let everyone get on with the, the rest of the conference, but uh, a big round of gratitude to everybody. Thank you. <laughs>